All right, everyone. So I think we'll get started here. Uh, so for, just in case anybody here is new, this is part of the Division 176 in Victoria's ongoing uh, online training that we've been doing as part of COVID-19. Uh, today, we're very lucky. We've got Dr. Nav Chima uh, joining us, who has presented this lecture before, and it is fantastic. I'm very excited to see it again. Uh, if any of you haven't been through one of these before, uh, we will stop for questions a couple times along the way. If you have questions as they come up, please just put them into the chat box. You can find it right at the bottom of your screen there. Just that way it helps us keep everything organized instead of having four people talking over there. And then I'll pass the questions along or Nav will read in the chat as we go. Um, uh, towards the end of the presentation, we will uh, open it up after Dr. Chim is done. We'll open it up for other people to ask their questions and if they want to discuss that way as well. If people prefer talking in person instead of just typing away in a box. Uh, these sessions are being recorded. They're available on our YouTube channel along with almost all of the previous sessions we've done in the past few months. Uh, we're coming up on our fourth month now of this. It's a little incredible how quickly it's come up. Uh, with that in mind, I'll pass it over to Nav here who will take us away. Thanks, Dave. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nav. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist who um, worked at uh, VGH for the past couple of years and now I'm currently just a week ago moved to Toronto to start my fellowship in trauma anesthesia at Sunnybrook Hospital and I'm going to be talking today about uh, patient positioning. Um, the alternate title of the talk is Trendelenburg the man the myth the legend um, but I stuck with the original uh, title because we're talking about a little bit of uh, things not just page, uh, not just Trendelenburg position um, yeah as Dave said if you have questions type them in the chat box I'll make pauses uh, as we go and answer them as we go and then uh, or if you want to discuss something at the end that's uh, totally fine as well um, uh, we had previously a lot of um, participants uh, coming in from Ontario as well so I now uh, uh, share your struggle with the late night uh, here so I uh, talk's going to be about an hour just over, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So um, without further ado, let's get started here. So um, we're going to talk about importance of position positioning, and then the three positions we're going to talk about is uh, Fowler's, uh, Trendelenburg. We're going to talk a little bit about shock positioning, and then uh, recovery position as well. So why should we even position our patients? Um, why do we care what pa uh, position patients are in? Well, for one thing, comfort, just as... Uh, Garfield is uh, showing here on his nice fluffy pillow. Um, patients, especially when they're in distress, want to be comfortable, try to alleviate any uh, pain and suffering that might be happening and putting them in a more comfortable position can help ease any ailments or anxiety that might be going on. Um, but more so than that, um, it's passive. It lets us free our hands. We can put them in position and kind of like the George Foreman grill, uh, set it and forget it, but don't actually forget it. You still got to pay attention. But um, there are some good evidence-based papers out there that actually let us utilize the positioning to make big gains from little movements. And really what we're trying to do is optimize the physiology and the mechanical functioning of the patient to try and um, uh, gain some improvement in the overall patient functioning. Um, and so why am I talking to you about patient positioning? What do I know about patient positioning? Well, in the operating room, when we're uh, performing surgery and uh, as anesthesiologists, we're usually the ones who are in charge of moving the table around and getting the patients into the exact patient uh, position they need to be in. When yes, well, the majority of uh, surgeries are performed in the supine or flat position. Um, we do go into alternate positions like in the middle Trendelenburg or sometimes we have patients sitting up. If we have to do uh, various surgeries like on uh, lower limbs or rectum, then they go into this extreme uh, tuck position. Sometimes we have to operate on the pelvis and the limbs get placed in all sorts of positions and have to be uh, arms and legs have to be roped up or tied in different positions. Sometimes arms have to be extended or held in a very non-anatomical position in order to gain access to the surgical site. And of course, if you're operating on the back, you have to flip the patient over to prone and uh, allow them to be in various uh, different positions. Um, some of these might be more in place in a book of uh, uh, um, uh, a romance novel, but we're going to keep out of that for now and just keep in some of these other positions for surgery. So, position patients a lot for surgery, and so I thought I'd go over some ones that we can do in the field. 
um, when we're positioning patients. Now, this talk actually, when I got the idea for this talk uh, a couple of years ago, it didn't actually start with Trendelenburg, it actually started with Fowlers, and it came because of a member in my department um, said to me, Nav, on the top of the ambulance sheet, it always says we can position patients uh, upright or supine or semi-fowlers. And he's like, I haven't been able to find a definition for semi-fowlers. And I was like, well, that's a good question. Why don't we go and uh, look that up? And so this all actually started with this search for the, the semi-fowlers position. So what is Fowler's position? Fowler's position was actually developed way back in uh, early 1900s, and it was um, developed by this uh, physician, George Ryerson Fowler, and he was looking at um, patients who developed uh, septic peritonitis. That's uh, inflammation of the inner lining of the abdomen, and it can be, at the time, from various different pathologies, um, most common one at the time would be like a perforated appendicitis. Um, he was actually more interested in peptic ulcer disease and perforated peptic ulcers, so stomach ulcers. Um, and, you know, way back then when before antibiotics, before all these other modern medicals, uh, medical achievements, um, many patients would die from pure infection. And so a lot of the focus on getting rid of the infection was on uh, actually going in, performing surgery and clearing out any infection. Or if the patient was too sick to tolerate the anesthesia at the time, which believe me, wasn't really that good, um, was to try and allow the body to wall it off and create an abscess. And what they found was that when they were trying, when the body was trying to wall off this abscess, um, Patients who had that abscess formation form in the pelvis, so lower down in the abdomen, had much better outcomes than if that abscess was allowed to form higher up, like near the stomach or liver or even above the liver by the diaphragm. And so um, he started positioning patients with this uh, septic peritonitis in different positions in order to try and promote the drainage of that pus and um, evil humor, so to speak, in a more uh, pelvic orientation so that the body could try and wall it off. And then when the patient hopefully had recovered somewhat, they could go in and clean up this abscess cavity rather than dealing with this really more diffuse disease that at the time was very difficult to treat. Now, interestingly, he was actually very focused on peptic ulcers. So that's when uh, you have an erosion through the stomach lining and you start to leak stomach contents into the abdomen. Very, very bad position. But um, surgeons started doing it for appendicitis, which naturally is a pelvic organ or can be placed lower in the pelvis at the time. And uh, they started experimenting with this position, especially for different types of surgeries. Um, and interestingly enough, they did notice that when you place someone head up, that you get a drop in blood pressure and the patient may uh, lose consciousness, especially if they're very sick and they have low blood pressure to begin with, as seen from this red rectangle on the left. Um, but, you know, despite all these changes, I think the, the, the best quote I had from this discussion about Fowler's position is what I found from a paper 1946, and it says, many surgeons believe that the best position for a sick patient is one in which he, is most, he or she is most comfortable. I think that holds true. We want to try and optimize the physiology uh, for the patient. We want to make sure they're all comfortable at the same time. So after that little history talk, let's talk a little bit more about this Fowler's position. So what is it? As I said before, initially it was um, promoted, uh, sorry, initially it was touted as a way to promote drainage of intra-abdominal contents into the pelvis, such that they could be walled off and form an abscess that could then be cleaned off after, it would try to decrease intra-abdominal infections. However, it, it evolved over the years and actually showed that patients in this position had um, more uh, relief when they had shortness of breath. And, they actually, and physicians actually found that they were breathing easier when they were sitting head up. Now, there's many different types, low fowlers, semi fowlers, semi fowlers, high fowlers. Basically, you position the patient head up with the hinge point being at the waist, somewhere between zero and 90 degrees. And harkening back to that original statement uh, about where this all began, as I said, uh, semi fowlers is somewhere between 30 and 45 degrees head up position. And why this works for shortness of breath is that uh, it improves your pulmonary mechanics in terms of how we breathe. Now, a little bit of review here. Remember that when we breathe, the diaphragm contracts, moves down in the abdomen, and all of our uh, upper chest muscles, as well as our accessory muscles, pull the rib cage up and out, and that allows the lungs to expand. And then when we exhale, the opposite happens, the diaphragm relaxes, uh, it goes back up into the chest cavity, and the rib cage moves down and in. So what we're doing essentially is we're allowing, we're using 
uh, gravity to our advantage to allow that diaphragm to pull down with gravity and improve the contraction of the diaphragm. Now, this is shown in this excellent um, research paper done in obese patients. And we're gonna pick obese patients because that's essentially just more pressure on the abdomen that's gonna be hindering diaphragmatic movement. And uh, what you're gonna see in this uh, graph here is three different representations of patient breathing. And um, don't worry so much about the um, uh, uh, acronyms here. FRC is uh, functional residual capacity, CC is closing capacity. What I want you to focus on is just the overall size of these loops here. And you can see that in the non-obese patient at rest, um, you have a nice big inspiration and expiration, no problem. Uh, obese patient, however, upright position, inspiration's okay, not so much expiration. And as you get more and more into the horizontal and then Trendelenburg position, which is where the, the head is lower than the heart and the legs are up, actually much decrease in inspiration and decrease in the other lung volumes associated with this loop. And this makes sense because if you have a patient who's obese or any patient, even non-obese patients, and you have them supine, so lying totally flat, all those abdominal contents are pushing on the diaphragm. So every time that diaphragm wants to contract and in the upright position, we're pulling down in the horizontal position, we're pulling sideways, um, it's gonna be fighting all those abdominal uh, components and all that abdominal pressure in order to contract. And so you can imagine then that if we sit the patient up slightly, and we don't even have to have totally 45 degrees flat, even just head up, then all of a sudden we're using gravity to help move some of those abdominal contents down and out of the way. And that diaphragm can contract a whole lot more. And that's really the, the, big, the big thing that we're trying to do here is allow, uh, is, is uh, use our, the positioning to promote physiological expansion of the lungs and uh, improve our oxygenation. Because the more those lungs can expand, the more air we're gonna breathe in, the more time there is for gas exchange, specifically oxygen and carbon dioxide, and the better uh, the patient's oxygenation will be. Now, I do, and this, sorry, uh, this has been shown in uh, papers. Um, so this is one, uh, for example, looking at patients who had increased abdominal pressure, such as from obesity, abdominal stension, or ascites. Ascites is collection of uh, fluid in the abdomen, usually from liver disease, but can be caused from other things, such as cancer. But uh, regardless of the pathology, the um, effect is still the same. You still have increased abdominal pressure that's going to be pushing on the diaphragm and chest. And uh, what they did was they moved the patients into different positions in this paper. And they looked to see how much the airway pressures and other uh, respiratory dynamics changed as they did that. And overall, what they found was that as they positioned them more in the head up position, the patients had large tidal volumes, lower respiratory rate, and overall less work of breathing. It makes sense. When you have a patient who's short of breath that you might encounter in the field and you want to try and improve um, their work of breathing, when you sit them up, they uh, generally feel better. And in fact, patients may, may try to achieve this position normally as well when they're feeling short of breath because they subconsciously, patients will know that it improves pulmonary mechanics. Now, Fowler's is different from tripoding, which is the classic thing you see in you know, um, OFA textbooks, EMR, MFR, all the ones they always talk about, watch for the patient with tripod. And they usually say that tripoding is a sign of patients who are in deep respiratory distress. Um, but why is that? And what's different between tripoding and Fowler's? So tripoding is a position where the patients lean forward, usually arms are braced on the legs. And um, it doesn't, so I, and more so you need the leaning in order to facilitate the bracing. But the important part here is that the arms are bracing on something, whether it's a chair, the legs or something. Um, and this allows the accessory muscles of breathing. So not the diaphragm, but all the other chest and neck muscles that we use for breathing subconsciously or consciously to expand and work more efficiently. And there's a whole ton of muscles that we use in breathing that are activated during uh, times of increased breathing. So normally just uh, you and me sitting here breathing normally, most of the work is being done by the diaphragm. But as soon as we get into increased work of breathing or increased activity where we need to be breathing more deeply, then we activate all these muscles. And they include muscles like the scalenes in the neck, the trapezius here in the back, sternocleidomastoid, the big one here in the front of the neck, um, pectoral muscles, as well as the abdominals and intercostals, which are all our uh, muscles that run along the ribs. 
And uh, don't just take my word for it. Let's take a look at this great paper that came out that proves this point so well. So um, we have three different positions that these researchers were testing. One in the normal position on the left here, and uh, one in the uh, tripoding position, and one with the tripoding position with uh, hands on the head. And then what they did was they attached uh, these sensors and electrodes onto the patient's chest. And you can kind of see that, the, and uh, sorry, chest, neck, um, and abdomen. And they measured the electrical activity in those muscle groups to see how much they were recruited and how efficiently they were working. And uh, the numbers uh, here are arbitrary units and uh, the groups at the bottom down here, uh, SM, SEM, and PM, those are different muscle groups. So SM, uh, I believe is scalene muscle, SEM is sternocleidomastoid, and PM is pectoralis. And then each bar uh, color is a different position. So the light gray is a normal position, the darkest of grays is um, just the normal tripod, and then the kind of middle gray color is uh, the one with the hands on the head as well. And for uh, scalenes and sternocleidomastoid, it didn't really make that much of a difference in positioning. But when we look at the pectoralis, we had way more pectoral activation and um, movement in the, in the tripod position and tripod with hands position. And that really makes sense is that uh, when you think of the mechanics of the pectoralis muscle and what it does naturally in terms of uh, movement, if you're able to break, because normally the pectoralis is bracing off the chest to help move your arms forward. Think about doing a bench press and how much uh, the pec muscles contribute to that. But now if we brace the arms and don't move the arms, then it's going to be moving the opposite part of that hinge, which is the chest. You're going to help expand that chest up and out and improve breathing. So great study. I always like this one because it's just so elegant in the design and, and how they showed this. Um, right, I will pause there for questions. Let's open up the chat. I don't see any questions. That's great, unless I'm missing something, Dave. If you're missing something, I'm missing something too. So All right, great. Let's keep going here. Uh, so now we're going to talk about Trendelenburg position, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, so let's start with uh, let's start with the man. So Trendelenburg uh, was a physician. Of course, these are all 1800, 1900, early 1900 physicians. Um, back in the time when surgery was a lot uh, uh, more gruesome, so to speak. Um, and uh, Trendelenburg uh, was trying to do a lot of operations on pelvic organs. Pelvic organs are lower abdominal organs, and um, when you open up an anatomy textbook and you look at how all the organs are displayed, you're like, wow, it looks so nice and neat. And in reality, it's very much not so like that. And uh, what you find is that when you're operating in the pelvis and with the pelvic organs, um, all the intestines and omentum and all those things tend to get in the way. You have to kind of push them out of the way and, and there's retractors and other things for that. But I, uh, Dr. Trendelenburg being the smart guy he was, was like, hey, well, let gravity do the work. And that's exactly what he did. So back in the olden days, you'd have an assistant who would um, hold the patient's legs above the, uh, above the level of the abdomen and uh, would promote drainage of the abdominal contents, including all the organs, to kind of shift up and would expose the pelvic organs so you could do operations on them. And even uh, now, we utilize this technique, especially for a lot of uh, gynecologic surgeries, so on the uterus or ovaries, uh, prostate surgery, bladder surgery. Um, we use this quite a bit in order to help facilitate that exposure of the pelvic organs, except now we don't have uh, someone holding the patient up like that. We have a table that can tilt uh, up and down. And when uh, Trendelenburg was first describing this position, he described it as the feet being 15 to 30 degrees higher than the head at the time. Um, the, I think the old Fay textbook quotes like 30 centimeters of rays above there and you'll get about the same amount at the time. Um, however, Trendelenburg has always been taught in first aid as a treatment of shock. I remember this from like, you know, you can think about this back to like entry level first aid class or OFA or even MFR at times, we talk about how, you know, find a patient who's in shock, put them in Trendelenburg immediately, raise those legs up. Um, and this harkens back way back to World War I, where uh, another physician, Dr. Walter Cannon, uh, proposed this as a treatment of shock and it made sense because at the time he found that, well, some patients, when you put them in Trendelenburg with the legs up, they get a rise in blood pressure and they get improvement in their color. Interestingly enough, he actually retracted his statement 10 years later when he found that it was 
wasn't working quite as he intended. And the goal of Trendelenburg for shock was to try and increase venous return, which would thus increase cardiac output and increase organ perfusion. So what does that mean? Let's just double back for a second. So increase venous return. Well, um, blood circulates around our bodies, pumped by the heart, goes to our arteries, goes to our end organs and capillary beds, and then returns to the heart via our veins. But the blood in our veins isn't always pumping at the same rate as our arteries. And you get a lot of blood that can kind of just sit there in the veins and slowly makes its way back to the heart. It's not as much of a rush as the, the blood in the arteries, you can say. Um, uh, and so it makes sense that if you raise the legs up, you can drain all that blood back to the heart so it can be pumped out again. And that's what I mean by when I say increasing venous return. If you allow more blood to go back to the heart, more blood's going to be pumped back out. And thus, you're going to be pumping more blood and increasing the cardiac output of the heart. And the idea is that if you're pumping more blood and getting more blood to the organs, they'll be perfused more because you're delivering more oxygen. That's the goal. In reality, you actually end up having variable venous return. And this may, may or may not lead to some cardiac output, but it really will most likely not be sustained. And even worse, your overall goal, which is to increase organ perfusion, really may not happen. In fact, you may actually end up with worsening organ perfusion, depending on what organ it is that you're looking at. So let's go through all of these. So myth, Trendelenburg improves blood pressure. Fact, Trendelenburg may raise blood pressure in some normal tensive patients. Uh, what is normal tensive? Normal tensive means normal blood pressure. But uh, consistently, it's failed to show that in hypotensive patients, patients with low blood pressure, that it'll lead to any sustained rise. And if it does cause a rise in blood pressure, it's usually short-lived, less than 10 minutes. Now, some people could argue, well, that's 10 more minutes of better perfusion, quite possibly. But there's been multiple studies, and I'll put a couple of ones uh, over later on, um, that show that it really doesn't make that much of an improvement in the long-term scheme. Um, one study that I'm showing here is that looking at a randomized control trial, looking at hypotensive patients who are hypovolemic, so who had uh, had blood or fluid loss, so bleeding patient or dehydrated patient, uh, and comparing those to normal tensive patients with normal blood pressure, Pace and Trendelenburg, found no difference in the amount of blood pressure increased between other groups. And in fact, for the patients with lower blood pressure, actually showed a lower decrease. Don't know the mechanism, but just some interesting um, things that they found in that one. Uh, myth, Trendelenburg improves cardiac output. Fact, Trendelenburg causes no change in cardiac output. So this idea that if we raise the legs up and you get more venous return, you know, there's a sustained increase in the amount of blood being pumped out. You may have a transient one, but in the patients that we're most concerned with, which are those patients who are hypotensive, uh, either so those with low blood pressure or those in shock, either from um, sepsis or hemorrhage or from having a cardiac uh, event such as a heart attack, um, it really won't have any, any uh, increase in cardiac output at the time. I mean, this even as far back as 1939, like this paper, which showed there is no, no change. And part of this reason has to do with the fact that, as I said before, there's no sustained increase. You get a transient increase of blood back to the heart, but the body compensates and won't be able to sustain that increase in cardiac output as long as before. Um, and this also has to do with the fact that the reason the patient might be in shock may not be because it's not uh, may not be because they have low circulating volume, such as blood loss or or fluid loss. It could be because maybe they're having a heart attack. Maybe they are uh, septic, so they have a bad infection, and the, all the blood vessels are dilated. They're just holding more volume in them, and there's nothing going back to the heart at the time. So uh, while certain types of shock may be transiently improved from this um, general number of positioning. Um, if you don't know what it is and you don't know how to treat it, then it may actually make things worse, as shown in this next study. So myth, Trendelenburg may improve organ perfusion, such as the brain. But the fact is that it may not actually change organ perfusion all that much. Uh, this study looked at uh, oxygen transport in hypovolemic patients, so patients who specifically had lost blood or fluid, and showed that the Trendelenburg position did not really make that much of a difference. Again, old study going back to 1994, but same kind of thing that really not improving anything. 
And let me make sure I got to talk about this later. I do, okay. So, uh, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but really if the whole goal is to improve shock, shock which is a uh, lack of or decrease in organ uh, perfusion and tissue hypoxia, so lack of oxygen at the tissues, we're really not doing any justice here, uh, doing it for our patients at the time. As I said before, numerous other studies looking at this, some observational, some randomized and looking at various different indices using control settings, um, really not that much of a sustained change in these patients. Now, why does it actually fail? Why are we not seeing this goal that, that was originally hypothesized at the time? Well, first of all, not all patients will respond to volume, i.e., the whole reason we're doing this or the idea that we're doing it is we're trying to mobilize some of that venous blood from the uh, legs back to the heart in order to improve uh, our cardiac output. But not all patients will respond to volume because not all patients have low volume status. And even some of the patients who have lost blood may not respond to it because they just don't have any, any, any volume left to give because it's, it's all you know, bled out on the, on, the, on the freeway over there. Um, and, and it's shown the fact that certain shock patients have little autotransfusion. This word autotransfusion basically means that we're, we're transfusing the patients from their own legs. We're increasing the amount of volume coming from their own legs. And a lot of the studies have shown that the patients who are in shock have already mobilized that because the body's natural response when you go into shock is trying to shunt blood back to, the cent, uh, back to the core from the periphery. So if we're trying to raise the legs up and get more, get more volume back, the body's already done that by itself. The other thing that can happen is that when we put the patients in Trendelenburg, we can actually put a lot more strain on the right ventricle. Right ventricle is something that's not really talked about that much um, because people always focus on the left ventricle, the ventricle that pumps blood to the body, whereas the right ventricle pumps blood to the heart. Uh, sorry, but pumps blood to the lungs. And um, when patients get placed in Trendelenburg, you can increase the amount of pressure, the venous pressure on the right ventricle. And the right ventricle doesn't like that. It doesn't like having that high pressure on it. It can actually start to fail. And patients who who have uh, compromised right, right ventricles from lung disease or previous heart disease, this can be bad. Now, I'm not saying that every patient this will occur in that there's many patients like in the operating room that we put in Trendelenburg, um, even some with uh, bad right ventricles will be fine, but it's something to think about at the time. Um, but when I, when I, the, the fact I was saying before about increasing organ perfusion, you have to remember that it's a balance. And on one side, you have the arteries that are flowing blood in, to the tissue, and on the other side, you have the veins that are carrying the blood back. And if you think of organs that are in the upper part of our body that we wanna try and perfuse, like the brain, we're gonna have an arterial pressure that's gonna be forcing blood this way. We have the capillary bed in the middle. We have the venous side here that's gonna be draining blood away. And if this venous pressure, sorry, backing up, and the amount of flow or the amount of perfusion going between the two is gonna be the difference in pressure between the arterial side and the venous side. So if we have high arterial pressure and low venous pressure, we have a natural gradient going down between the two. However, if that difference is decreased, like if somebody has low blood pressure and high venous pressure, then the amount of perfusion in between is gonna be decreased. Now, gross oversimplification, but it, I think it helps get the point across. And this is what I mean when I say increased venous congestion. If that venous pressure is higher, or getting close to the arterial pressure, we're overall gonna have less pressure, uh, less uh, um, uh, perfusion pressure that's be going through that capillary blood bed and allowing oxygen uh, transport to occur. Also, uh, patients who are head down, they're gonna have increased intracranial pressure. We worry about this in patients who have had head trauma or may have intracranial pathology. Um, and again, this is gonna decrease the amount of uh, tissue perfusion that's gonna be happening in the brain. Lastly, remember that uh, unlike in the OR where I'm able to intubate patients or patients to have protected airways, um, and some of our patients who might be having low blood pressure, they might be going to unconsciousness, and they might be at increased risk of aspiration, especially in the head up, oh, sorry, head down position where the stomach, content, stomach is higher than the um, uh, pharynx and uh, especially on conscious patients, that allows fluid to come out of the stomach and into the mouth, which would be bad. And lastly, 
patients just don't like being head down. You can feel that. Like even if you tilt yourself back, you put your head lower than your heart, you just feel very claustrophobic. You sort of feel congested even, and especially in patients who have difficulty breathing, which many may because especially in shock, they might be having some increased work of breathing, try and get more oxygen in to compensate. Uh, it's a very um, anxiety provoking position. So especially in the conscious or semi-conscious patient, not a good idea. So these are some of the reasons why Trendelenburg fails and why it's not really maybe that good. What does make sense is determining if the patient may respond to fluids eventually. And this is the difference between Trendelenburg positioning and doing a maneuver called a passive leg raise. Now, I do want to put the caveat in here that this is well beyond the scope of any MFR and probably beyond the scope of um, some PCP stuff. But we do this a lot in the hospital, um, nurses and physicians, where we will do this to see if a patient who has low blood pressure or patients in shock may respond to fluid therapy. And what we're doing is we're utilizing that uh, unsustained transient change in blood pressure to or other uh, indices to see whether if we give the patient fluid, we'll get a uh, sustained response afterwards. And what we're doing is we're starting with them in a uh, normal kind of somewhat head up position. And then we flip them on their back with their legs up. And we look at the indices of cardiac output or blood pressure if we don't have that. And we see if there's a change. And we see we're looking for an increase. And again, it's going to be a transient, but we're looking for an increase. And this is what you do is you put the patient slightly head up, look at the indice of cardiac output, and then you flip them kind of a, a supine with their legs up. And you do that same measurement again. And you see if there's an increase only in your cardiac output, also your blood pressure. If that's the case, then you put them back in the normal position and you give them some fluid. So some uh, normal saline or ring of or plasma light or blood if you think they need it, et cetera. And so we use it, but we use it more as a diagnostic tool in the hospital rather than a treatment tool because the treatment that they ultimately need potentially is some kind of volume expansion, from either crystalloid, colloid, or blood product at the time. And again, Beyond the scope of MFR, but I just wanted to make, I didn't want to completely uh, poo poo on Trendelenburg here. There are some ways that we can use it to help guide us in clinical decision making. Um, other things that might be useful for, for uh, uh, especially for uh, PCPs or, or uh, any providers that are able to put IVs in, is that, um, as I said, you do get that transient increase in, um, in uh, cardiac output and a transient increase in venous congestion. So if there's no contraindications to putting a patient in Trinellenberg, you could do that to help get veins to pop up, um, let you get an IV in, and then give them the fluid that they ultimately need. But otherwise, uh, uh, you know, apart from where I use in the OR for patient positioning for surgery, um, really, I don't think it, it has that much use. It's still probably gonna be taught in MFR and first aid courses, et cetera. But um, for now, follow your local guidelines, but just kind of have some ideas about what, what else might be going on. Okay, uh, any questions on Trendelenburg positioning? I don't see any questions in chat. I'm gonna keep going. How are we getting for time here? Lots of time, perfect. Okay, so the last position, uh, last positioning I want to talk about was recovery position. One of my favorite positions, gotta say. If I had to like pick a favorite position, it would be recovery position. Um, so uh, where did it start? Well, if you think back to a couple months ago when I gave my airway talk, I talked about this initially. Uh, it developed way back in the late 1800s. My physician, Dr. Robert Boyles, uh, who was working in England, he was working in patients who had stroke. And uh, there's this paper on surgery, apoplexy management of the apoplectic state, basically talking about how you would manage uh, stroke patients. And uh, he was talking about this because after a stroke, especially after a large one where um, a lot of muscle groups might be affected, uh, patients have difficulty swallowing and managing their own secretions. And if they were nursed in the standard position, they may choke, aspirate on their, on, um, their saliva or on something they're eating, and, um, and then they would develop pneumonia and subsequently pass away. Um, and so he recognized this and he said, well, well if we put them on their side, then uh, contents in the, out in the uh, mouth can naturally drain out and won't collect and potentially go down into the lungs. Um, another, uh, it's got picked up by uh, numerous other physicians and surgeons, but it took a while until a kind of surgery textbook caught up with this years later. Um, St. John started teaching it in the 1950s. 
uh, before it crossed um, and now it's used around the world uh, wholeheartedly uh, for a great effect. Um, so what are the main benefits of the recovery position? Well, it's one of the uh, great ways of having passive management of the area. Passive meaning that we don't actually have to be there, right there holding the airway open. We can let gravity do the work, put them in the recovery position, uh, let the jaw sit forward, tongue falls forward, and it allows a patent airway to be maintained. Prevents aspiration, as I said, because it allows uh, saliva and other uh, oral contents to kind of pool in the mouth and fall out. Um, possibly better breathing mechanics. Um, you know, if you're on your side, maybe the, in the stomach, uh, abdominal pressure kind of hangs forward a little bit rather than right on the um, uh, diaphragm. So maybe a little bit better breathing, but, but overall, um, big thing here is that it's passive area management, preventing aspiration, and possibly maintaining patent airway if you're able to position the patient correctly. Well, Il Ilcor put out a number of recommendations about recovery position, especially in relation to um, how these patients are managed. And again, as I said, this isn't quite like the George Foreman grill, like set it and forget it. You still gotta be maintaining the patient um, in a state where you're able to assess them constantly, especially to make sure that that airway is still patent and that they're not pooling secretions somewhere else where they shouldn't be. Uh, more on this later. Um, as you position them, you finish your make sure it's stable. So make sure they can like roll off or into a position like straight head down or back onto their back. And you should be having a plan for being able to flip them back to supine in case you have to do any kind of intervention on them. You should be able to observe the patient and uh, keep track of their breathing and their airway status. And you should make sure that obviously you're not going to cause any further injury to the patient uh, in that position. Now. Um, Everyone's always concerned about C-spine injury, and you should be. Um, but uh, what it says, well, what if I have an unconscious patient with possible C-spine injury? Well, um, what was developed was Haynes position, high arm in endangered spine. And what this is done is basically you take the one arm, normally it's lying flat against uh, the floor, and you're raising it up and allowing their head to rest on this, basically trying to keep uh, spine in as neutral position as possible with the head. And uh, as position says, high arm and nature spine um, uh, keeps the neck and head aligned and prevents any movement, sorry, I shouldn't say prevents, but minimizes any movement of the cervical spine that may exacerbate an already um, present uh, C spine injury. Now, the evidence for this isn't as strong as some of the other evidence that I've shown you. This uh, paper looked at um, imaging analysis and radiographic studies and basically showed that like when you put a patient in this position, there isn't that much C-spine movement, but um, still a great position. And uh, really what we worry about is, are we gonna be causing any worsening of the patient? Because that's what we really worry about is, so you know, we can put them in the position and right? we wanna make sure they're protected, but if we're actually causing more harm than good, then obviously not a good idea. Now, uh, this group did a systematic review, looking at tons of studies, and um, uh, didn't find a whole lot of real life data looking at morbidity and mortality, and that's just because no one's really looked at this in the past. Um, this review is a little bit old, it's 2015, I, wasn't, I had a quick look and couldn't find anything more recent. They did, however, look at a lot of cadaver studies. Now, Granted, a lot of these studies are looking at lumbar and thoracic spine, not C-spine, but um, a lot of imaging studies done previously have shown that uh, there is minimal movement. And ultimately, if you had to choose between having uh, the uh, airway, which is gonna be compromised, or the C-spine, which may become compromised, you gotta pick airway because it's always ABCs before. I know we can always say DABC now, but you wanna make sure that the head's nice and neutral, but you gotta protect that airway at the same time. Make sure you allow for good oxygenation to occur. Because ultimately, the things we find in C-spine injuries is that um, maintaining good blood pressure, good oxygenation, are gonna do more for protecting that C-spine than any amount of delicate positioning and everything else we do. So I'll be careful, but those are where we can make the biggest strides in trying to prevent further injury. Now, um, have we, what about airway patency, as I said before? Um, this group looked at a lot, number of studies and showed that in the lateral position, especially in the trauma patient, you're still able to protect the airway and ensure good patency. Sorry, excuse me. 
and still ensure good patency at the time. Um, that's all I want to say about that. Now, the real question when we put these patients in any positioning is does it cause any harm? And uh, after this paper came out, the one from 2015 looking at trauma patients, um, it was, uh, the recovery position got picked up with a lot more kind of vigor, I think, and talked more. And there's excellent response looking at the European resuscitation guidelines. And this gentleman who said, you know, a lot of the CPR guidelines were developed at a time where we said, you know, we're going to place patients who are unconscious but breathing still in the recovery position then go and call for help. And he made the point of saying, well, everyone has a cell phone these days. Is this really necessary? I mean, I can't think of a time where I've gone out of the house where I didn't have my cell phone on me unless I've forgotten it for some reason. I mean, even now when I'm in my house, like my cell phone's right here, like it's, it, they're everywhere. And so the point that he was making was that, well, this could be causing more harm. And he pointed to some of the data that they had done. I think it was in Spain, if I remember. Yeah, in Spain, where they had patients who were unconscious but breathing with a pulse, placed in the recovery position, and then the person went and go went and called for help, which was you know what they were taught to do at the time. And when they and, and they were left there in the recovery position, even if the patient, the, even if the person calling for help didn't leave, they were just left in the recovery position like they were told to, like good first aiders. And then when EMS arrived, emergency medical services, they found the patients were actually in cardiac arrest because they had stopped breathing and no one had known that because they're in a recovery position because they weren't being monitored effectively. And so they came up with this brilliant study that I absolutely love. It just shows how you can, how you can prove some of these points and, and make changes. This is a year after he, he posted this reply. And he said, does the recovery position actually increase the likelihood of not receiving CPR if you need it? And this is a great study. I'm going to walk you through it. And what they did was, is they got professional, um, they were either divers or water, water, polar, water polo players. I can't remember which one. But they basically got um, some uh, essentially uh, actor participants who could hold their breath for a really long time. And then they got um, uh, people to assess whether they stopped breathing or not. So what they would do is they would, Get the uh, get the. I'm gonna call them. I'm gonna call them water polo players. No, I'm not because I'm gonna get difficult to say. I'm gonna call them deep sea divers. They got a bunch of uh, free divers to be positioned in recovery position or head tilt chin lift. That's what the HTCL is. And then they got the uh, responders to monitor them at the time. And uh, at some point, the divers would hold their breath, and then they timed to see how long it would take for the responder to notice whether the, the, the patient, quotation marks, has stopped breathing. And what you can see is that in recovery position, half of them missed identifying when the patient stopped breathing, compared to less than 20% of the patients in head tilt chin lift. And that kind of makes sense, right? You put them in recovery position, and then you kind of back away, or maybe you're a little further away because you're doing something else. But head tilt chin lift, like you're right they're holding that head tilt chin lift. So you'll be able to identify um, really quickly uh, uh, if, if the patient stops breathing. And, you know, it wasn't that long of a time, um, 30 seconds versus 17, but I think that's still significant. And remember, these, were, were, these uh, participants in the study knew that the patients were going to stop breathing at some point. So they knew it was going to be happening. So they should have been monitoring. But even then, um, you know, they still missed it. So I think what this comes down to is that if you're going to place a patient in the recovery position, it's still a great position. It's an excellent method of passive airway control. It's safe in C-spine injuries, but you need to monitor the breathing frequently, especially if they're rolled away from you, you can't see them um, as well. Uh, I saw a question pop up here. Let's see. I'm sure Div 176 has better numbers. Yes, I am definitely sure Div 176 has better numbers. Div 176 is my home division in Victoria. Um, uh, yes, definitely. Um, all right, guys, I think that's the end of my talk. It's a short one because I'm talking from Toronto and it's getting late here and I have to go and <laughs> apply for health insurance tomorrow at Services Ontario, which because of COVID, everything's closed and we have to line up. So uh, a little bit of a short talk. That's the end of my talk. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat or if you want to, I don't know, if 
Dave can unmute mics or not. Um, but yeah, happy to talk about it now or anything else related to positioning or questions you might have. Um, yeah. Oh, got a chat one here. Uh, are we to follow this protocol or staying with the AMFR guidelines? Um, still keep following your AMFR guidelines. As I said, these talks are more for general interest and to promote discussion, but they're not meant to, uh, uh, they're not meant to supersede any guidelines put out by St. John Ambulance or MFR training or your own local practices. Um, just something to think about. So yeah, keep doing whatever your local guidelines say for, for your positions. All right, thanks uh, everyone. I'm gonna sign off here. Um, hopefully many things will open up again and I can come visit the, some of the Toronto groups at some point, but uh, otherwise uh, stay safe out there and keep your stick on the ice.